Uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It gives me a great pleasure to set the context for this uh, next panel discussion, which is coming within the 43rd AGM of IFKI, the Indian French Chamber of Commerce. Uh, we are inviting for soloing global leaders of various IFKI members across all sectors of activity. And the theme is, can India become truly a global hub as a market and for manufacturing? This theme is extremely very timely, actually. As uh, Sumit said, because of COVID and despite COVID. Actually, when you will talk, please think about three ideas. Ease of doing business. Actually, India, over the last months, years, has had a very great dynamic move, now being on the 63rd rank, where some years ago, it was at the 150th rank. So a great move. Make, me, make in India has become a very political word and is used in every, in every uh, actually, in every industry. And the last one, I will try to pronounce it correctly, Atmar Nirbar Bharat, or autonomy. Self-autonomy for India is actually the vision. So those ideas should really be behind your, your words and your comments as distinguished members of this panel. I welcome now Mr. Govindra Itiraj to chair this uh, fantastic panel and have a rich and eventful discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. And let me plunge straight ahead, considering that we are running late. What I'm going to do is ask each of uh, the speakers that I'm going to go to to speak for about two or three minutes each. Uh, we are quite a large panel, so uh, I'm, we could have had more time, but we now don't. So, uh, and I'm also assuming that everyone has access to your uh, backgrounds and uh, you are pretty well known uh, and so are your companies for many years. So uh, let me start with uh, uh, Jerome. Uh, do you want to go first? So the idea is to talk, I mean, you know the theme, it's about India becoming a global hub, both as a market and for manufacturing. So maybe the question that you could address is, uh, what are the opportunities that you see uh, right now? And then I can come back later maybe with questions. Okay, you have to unmute uh, Jerome. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Yeah. All right. So first of all, I would like to thank you for inviting me to this panel. It's a, it's a privilege and an honor to be sent back even for a few minutes to India because it's a country where I used to live and uh, where I, which I still cherish a lot. I try to be quick because I understand that we don't have much time and uh, I try to give you uh, some example of what's going on with our company, Aremond. I'm currently in charge of Aremond in France, but Aremond is... Um, a family business I started uh, uh, in 1865, 155 years ago, specialized in uh, fasteners for the automotive industry. And I believe uh, the story of uh, Aremond in India gives a good example of what India is capable to, is able to, to produce and to achieve. Uh, our um, entity in India started in 2007 uh, and uh, through the innovation, you can uh, get the sense of innovation, creativity uh, with uh, the people uh, you have in India, uh, the, the quality of um, uh, competencies in engineering, other, other um, uh, areas. There is no doubt that you can reach international standards. And uh, Aremond India is definitely uh, demonstrating that uh, in, in a very um, impressive way uh, today. Um, first, because it's a, it's a subsidiary of Aremont Group who brought international customers to the network, to the whole uh, uh, global company. It's uh, an entity where um, new technical solutions have been developed and uh, deployed elsewhere. Uh, and more recently, it's also a, a company 
that had been able to show its resilience during COVID. Uh, the, whole, uh, the whole network of entities of uh, Aremon uh, company has gone through uh, very difficult times, uh, like many. But uh, Aremo India is probably one of the very few entities in our company who is still able to post growth in 2020 as compared to 2019. Are very very little. It's the only one, or there may, there may be uh, only two in uh, in our network of um, entities. And uh, this, while uh, taking very good care of uh, people, I believe this is something that uh, where we can definitely. Uh, take example of what has been uh, 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 performed in India, uh, taking care of the of the competencies on board, making sure that they will still be on board uh, after the crisis. And this is very much needed today because now we, we go through a rush of activity and uh, uh, our colleagues in India can be very happy to have, to have protected somehow their workforce despite all the difficulties, despite all, all the risks that they were coming through. And um, uh, whether we're talking about resilience of the entity or maybe the, the capacity to, to perform in very um, uncertain environment, which is what's going to happen to us even in Europe, uh, I believe that there is a lot to learn uh, from India. And now I'm back to France, so I see India for a bit afar, but uh, there are many, many uh, qualities available in this country uh, that we should observe and uh, take for us uh, elsewhere to manage the situation that we have in front of us. Right. Uh, quick question. So you said uh, you've done well uh, or will do well in 2020. So is that OEM uh, automotive or something else? That's and Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's that, that would, it would be good to yeah, know. Yeah, it's, it's automotive with also special uh, uh, positioning for India because uh, Aremond is 96, 97 percent dedicated to the automotive business. But in India, uh, we have started this year with a two-wheeler industry, which is unique to the company, uh, with again uh, quite a, a successful penetration on this market. Right. So you're saying that because the two-wheeler has been somewhat steady or growing relative to everything else, you've also done better. Is, is that correct? Or it, it is correct. But even without two-wheelers, we, right. do, we would have over over uh, perform as compared to last year which is right. quite okay. amazing in the current context. Yes, absolutely. Okay, great. Uh, Alain uh, Papias, can I uh, uh, invite you to speak for the next sure. few minutes? Sure, Govindra, very, very nice to meet you. Uh, needless to say that India for Ben Pepariba uh, has supported, I would say, a very long-term commitment because we opened in 1860. And if I'm information are correct, uh, we have been the, the second oldest uh, foreign bank in India operating for uh, close to 160 years now, uh, which shows uh, the importance of India for the group. And first we opened in India to support our uh, French clients operating in that country in the middle of the 19th century. Uh, I would not elaborate on India as a global hub for manufacturing because I'm surrounded on screen at least by people who have probably better knowledge on the industry than I am. Uh, but I will take my uh, banker's hats because I think part of the question is uh, can India become a, a global hub or a key global market in the world? Alors, having operated in that country for 160 years, I would say we are very happy of the development and at the, and at the same time we find it sometimes uh, difficult to qualify India as a global hub for, serious, for a series of reasons. And I think the capacity of the country to become a global financial hub is there, but needs probably some uh, enhancement or some modification in the way uh, banks uh, globally operate in India. Uh, first thing, we have 12,000 people operating in India, and clearly the quality of the workforce, the training, uh, is exceptionally good. And we support investment banking activities, market activities, security services activities, cash management, etc., which we believe uh, are uh, very important businesses for the Indian economy. Uh, where I see some challenges to go from that stage to the next one, which could be the global hub concept, uh, the first one is uh, we need more liberi liberalization of uh, the capital market activities. I mean, uh, and I would say 
probably the most uh, difficult thing for banks to operate in India is that the transferability of the rupee is limited, uh, which means that it's not a totally open market. I mean, it's a market very controlled, and, and obviously you cannot be a hub for international needs if the transferability of the currency is not totally proven, and you know that there are limits of duration, we cannot swap uh, currencies above a certain time, etc., etc. Uh, second thing is that the banking regulation in India, which I follow uh, at the group level for 15 years, is a very complex one. Uh, you talk to lawyers which are specialized in regulation and they tell you, uh, yeah, but be careful, there is a regulation coming from Delhi, the local regulation, etc. And um, having had the opportunity for some acquisition that Ben Pepaiba made to have VDs with the Ministry of Finance uh, Cabinet Director in Delhi, it's complex. And then some simplification would be welcome, I would say, for foreign investors. Um, after that, when you when you look at uh, books about what makes uh, a financial hub efficient, uh, communication, quality of the environment is very important. Then I think everything which is data, transfer of data, quality of uh, uh, computer equipment is great. Uh, issuance of visas for people who come to work in India could be a little... Uh, improved, uh, because it's still uh, sometimes a little cumbersome. Uh, it, it's not a, a major obstacle, but it could fluidify the processes. After that, uh, stable legal uh, tax regulatory environment for people who decide to operate long-term businesses in India is absolutely critical. And, uh, and I think that's also a way where if India decide uh, to become a financial hub uh, for international companies, including Indian one, which I think is a need because when I see the tension between the US and China, we'll see a lot of corporates moving some of their businesses out of China to go to India, but they will need support from international groups, financial groups. And for that, uh, there are a little things that we need to be twisted so that we can operate in a more fluid and uh, agile environment. Otherwise, I mean, the group is uh, very supportive, ready to have discussion uh, uh, with you, Sunit, and uh, the ambassadors and the government whenever to, uh, to try to make our case that we could do even more in your country for the international needs of our clients. Uh, very happy to be with you and uh, happy to answer any question you may have, uh, Govind Raj. Right. So first one, uh, you said you were the second bank uh, to come, foreign bank to come into India. So who beat you to it? Uh, the first one was Green Lace. I thought it was okay. <laughs> right. We uh, could have I'm, tried at that time that the French would be the first bank in India, first foreign bank, but uh, a British one came just before us. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I, I'm going to come back because I also wanted to get a sense on uh, how you're seeing global capital flows and, you know, uh, and, and to all the panelists, I think uh, we also want to know where does India stand? I mean, you're all managing global portfolios, so it would be good to know, I mean, what, what is India competing with in order to, uh, I mean, we may have ambitions, but uh, that those ambitions are always in context. Okay. Uh, Laurie, follow up. Could you go next? My microphone is on. Thank you very much, uh, Kevin Raj. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, just to introduce myself, I'm Laurent Follop. I'm the uh, Commercial and Marketing Director of Aropa. Aropa means uh, Le Havre, Rouen and Paris, which is the three ports uh, of the Seine River uh, in the north of, of France, where I'm, I am today. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for inviting me again. Um, I'm, I'm going to take uh, six to seven minutes, not more. Uh, uh, to uh, give you our, first of all, our perception of the Indian market uh, as per our port and uh, economic activity point of view, uh, what we are doing today to uh, support uh, the India's development and uh, what are our future challenges uh, uh, in, the, in the world today uh, uh, in the COVID period that we are facing uh, uh, everybody. Uh, first of all, our perception of the Indian market, uh, according to the international uh, trade that we are managing is uh, India is a really fast growing country. Uh, India is a member of the G20 with the strongest growth in uh, GDP since uh, more than 10 years now. If I look at the figures, uh, 
2014 was uh, plus 7%, 2015 plus 8%, etc. So it's really uh, something that is important for you, for us, because it's really fast today. Uh, plus a global view on a strategic assist on the uh, Make in India policy, which is very important for us. The program has been set up in uh, 2014 by the government, which aims to increase the GDP share of uh, the manufacturing sector to uh, 25% in 2022 and uh, 30% in uh, 2040. This program targets uh, uh, 25 very strategic sectors, very interesting for us, of course, uh, mainly uh, textile, uh, foods, uh, machine tools, transportation, electronic and defense, for example, in which India has a really a competitive advantage today. Uh, I can also uh, uh, give the example of uh, healthcare industry, pharmaceutical industry, and also information technology. Uh, the, the policy is, the policy, uh, is uh, explicitly aimed at promoting investment in the manufacturing sector and making India a real hub uh, for me for regional and international markets. Uh, to do this, India already has uh, some uh, very important and main advantage. Uh, a very competitive and uh, qualified uh, workforce, of course, but above all the uh, entrepreneurial structure are composed of large groups today. Huh? Uh, if I take the example of Reliance, Tata, for example, which is uh, also big group for us, and more than 50 million Indian uh, sub subcontracted companies. Uh, based on this uh, overall strategy, uh, we are already focused ourselves on uh, some strategic uh, sector to continue to promote our business and to continue to have exchange between India and Europe going through France. Uh, the first one is textile and garments, which is a very important sector for us. Uh, on our export side, looking, looking at the potential of the Indian garment market, more and more international brands are entering today the market, not only the the main one that we know already, like uh, the French luxury products like uh, uh, Chanel, Louis Vuitton and the other ones, but also uh, some brands like uh, Lacoste, Celio and Promod are investing more and more in India today. Second sector, which is very interesting for us and certainly at this period uh, very sensitive is the healthcare sector. The pharmaceutical sector, India represents 42% of the world medicine production and export 20% of the world's generic drugs. The country has leaders such as uh, Lupin, Torrent, Cipla, Sitka, but also all the international groups today have uh, some production units uh, or different suppliers in Indian country, like uh, Sanofi, for example, like Boiron or Novartis. Uh, it is for our ports today, the third, uh, the, number, the number three in terms of commodity category imported from India in 2019. The third uh, uh, in, uh, strategic sector for us is energy and chemical. Uh, India is the leading exporter uh, of petroleum products in Asia. It is also a, a very large importer of basic products and raw material because, it is, uh, uh, because of its important development since many years. The country energy supply will be one of its greatest challenges and at the same time an opportunity in the transfer to new energy today. Okay, Aropa is also being chosen by uh, a big group that you may know, uh, Siemens Gamesa, to develop uh, a wind farm industry in the port. So change of uh, uh, energy today would be also a key success and India will be part of it, certainly. Uh, so after the general introduction, ISIA is of course a key uh, business partner and continue to grow with uh, uh, our ports and with Aropa. Uh, just to give you some figures, around uh, more than 30% of for maritime global maritime global container traffic on the 10 last years, we have increased more than 30% the volume. Two thirds of this business is on import, of course, from India to uh, to France, uh, and our top commodities are textile, clothes, synthetic rubber, and latex, uh, synthetic rubber, latex for our export. We uh, concentrate our business to Mumbai area, of course. Uh, but not only with an important part of development uh, for uh, the port of Mundra, Azira, and also the region of Tamil Nadu, Chennai, Tutikorin, uh, and also Kolkata, which is a uh, more and more growing uh, going port for us. Uh, what is important to say is sea uh, freight company, the big ones, for example, like MSC, uh, WCL, APAC, Costco, ONE, 
continue to invest and create new services, uh, uh, fast services between uh, 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 between uh, India and Europe. Uh, to be able to conclude, what uh, uh, how we can we continue to support India at, and what are our new challenges? Uh, we continue to have regular missions. Alors, this year it's not possible, unfortunately, but we continue to come to India uh, with a, a meeting with sports governments representative, plus some uh, panel speech on many logistic conferences in order to share our strategy uh, and uh, our initiative on digitalization, for example, sustainable developments as well. Uh, light motif is also to support customers, which is important, to become more global, more digital today, and India is really a part of our strategic business for that, and also to become smarter and greener, which is important for the ports today, really mm -hmm. smarter and greener. So, um, and I finish just uh, right. due to the COVID, we certainly have uh, more uh, things to develop like logistics today, warehousing activity, we will have more stocks today, and uh, more generally, there is a really, uh, uh, we will continue to develop and to, go, to get great success. So definitely, yes, uh, uh, India is the global hub for manufacturing with international port, international port of view, for sure. Right, thank you very much. Uh, Mark Pasquet, uh, Michelin, can you go ahead? Yes, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Govet. Uh, I'm, I'm very pleased to be uh, with you today. So I'm Mark Pesky. I'm uh, the president of Michelin uh, Africa, India and Middle East. I'm based out of uh, Dubai. Uh, as a company, Michelin operates in more than 170 uh, countries and we are on the uh, entire landscape of mobility. So in India, we go from supplying tires to uh, two wheelers, passenger cars, truck buses, up to the Mumbai monorail. And sometime when you fly, when we will fly back, you know, we'll be also on uh, Michelin tires uh, since we're supplying major aircraft carriers uh, in India. Uh, just to give you an idea, in India, we have close to 3,000 uh, employees. Uh, the Indian market is the first two-wheeler market in the world, just to give you an idea of how big is India. is the fourth biggest car market after Germany is the fifth biggest aircraft market. Uh, when we look at the population of India, the India middle class will soon be bigger than the entire uh, European population. So just to give you also uh, an idea of the potential. And 35% of the Indian population lives in urban area. So when uh, Laurent was talking about ports, we uh, for sure, you know, more goods will be coming. Uh, when uh, Mr. Papias, uh, Alain Papias was talking about banking services, it will come as well. So clearly, you know, India has a huge potential because of the size, of course, of the country and the population, but also because it's an evolving population with new needs. We are convinced at Michelin that the mobility needs will evolve in India. And the reason why we came 20 years ago and put a plant in Chennai is because the mobility needs are coming up. Uh, all of you that live in India, you see the air quality issues we're facing. We also see a lot of issues in terms of road safety. The reported fatalities per year are close to 150,000 people dying on the roads per year. It's close to 400 people dying every day on the roads of India, and this is reported. So it may be bigger. So clearly as a company, and since we believe that everything will be sustainable, when we come to India, we want to contribute to a sustainable mobility, but also to a safer mobility. And that's why when we came to India, we came with the latest technology, and we came also with a lot of activities to help people have a safer mobility. This year with Total, we will be training close to 9,000 kids in 110 schools across the country to teach them how to be safer on the roads. Um, maybe one last reference about uh, India and the sustainability. Just keep in mind that 20% of the fuel you use in your car is coming from the tires. So clearly you can see that the tires can be a huge contributor in terms of uh, improving the air quality of, uh, of India. So um, when it comes to uh, 
India as a hub for manufacturing. We came to India. We are bringing the latest technology. We want to differentiate by the top. So we bring low rolling resistance tires, safer tires. From a business perspective, when we settled our operations in India, I would say that our experience has been pretty good. Uh, we set up the uh, operation in Chennai. We have a new operation, digital worldwide hub uh, in Pune. And so far it has been good, even though uh, some infrastructure such as road and electricity could have come on time that would have really helped. Uh, do we have the ability to at some point uh, manufacture from India out for outside of India? We do it already. But if we wanted to accelerate that, for sure we would need, and I think Alain was talking about it, we would need maybe a little bit more visibility on some regulation that may come uh, to hit us. We've been impacted in the past. We are impacted currently with some import restriction. Uh, we are working with the uh, Indian government. But when you invest for hundreds of millions of euros setting up a new manufacturing plant, you need visibility on regulation that could impact your business. You need visibility and ease of doing business progress have been made, but on labor, labor rules uh, for so clearly, you know, there is a, a way to go and, and we're contributing with Indian government to help ease uh, the way we are doing business in India. Right, Mark, thank you for that. Uh, I'm going to race ahead now. Uh, Jean-Marc Boudin, could you go next, please? Yes. Yes, good afternoon. Good uh, afternoon to minutes. everybody. Yeah, about three minutes. We yeah. have to find by okay. about 6.35. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Yes, yes. Do you hear me? Yes. Yes, okay. Good afternoon to everybody. So as far as uh, Thales is concerned, it's almost uh, 50 years that we are in India with a strong presence. We have 1,800 employees in the country. And uh, we are doing uh, business in the field of defense, transportation. We have made uh, the signaling of Hyderabad Metro uh, in the aerospace, uh, serving uh, uh, Indigo, for example, and uh, in uh, digital identity and security in India. Uh, to the question, uh, can India become a key uh, global market and a global hub? Uh, we've already answered. Uh, there is an initiative uh, in uh, Thales, which is called uh, Going Global. And uh, at uh, the global level, we have decided uh, that uh, the three main pillars uh, of our uh, industry are going to be uh, US, China, and India. Uh, and for that, we have uh, developed uh, several things uh, in India, especially uh, we have uh, uh, out of the, the, the joint venture that we already have in India, we have a joint venture with Bharat Electronic uh, for others, another one with Somtel. Uh, dedicated uh, to military uh, avionics and with uh, Reliance Aerostructure uh, for uh, airborne radars and electronic warfare. But on top of that, uh, to uh, enlarge uh, our presence uh, in uh, India, we have a, a digital uh, and uh, engineering center. One uh, digital uh, center uh, uh, which is uh, in uh, Noida uh, and which is employing uh, 900 uh, engineers and uh, the main, uh, uh, I would say, asset of India is the highly uh, skilled workforce we can uh, find uh, in India. On top of that, we have built in uh, Bangalore an, uh, uh, an engineering center which is serving the whole corporation in, uh, in to the areas uh, we are acting, defense, aerospace, again, transportation business. And uh, we are uh, planning uh, to grow it and uh, we hope to reach uh, quite soon uh, 1,200 uh, engineers uh, in India. So to the question, Again, uh, key global market, yes, India is a key global market. Global hub, yes, very good, uh, very good uh, hub, uh, having a uh, lot of uh, resources and uh, valuable uh, resources. You're on mute, I don't hear you. You're on mute. 
I, I do recall in our conversation earlier, you saying that smart metering was one of your uh, thrust areas and opportunities as well. Yes, yes. Uh, just to illustrate that it is uh, on one side a, a big market and on the other right. side a global player. There is a need for smart metering in India. And according to the size of the population of India, it's certainly uh, the product we are going to develop for the Indian market is going to be certainly the reference at the, the, the worldwide level. And the smart metering for us is a good example of uh, the, the, the way India uh, can uh, uh, be right. uh, spread all over the world. Right. Uh, Namita, it's over to you. Uh, and there's Sumit after that. I'm sorry, uh, it's a long list. So Namita, go ahead. Sorry to keep you guys waiting. No, not at all. So, um, so, so I'm. Uh, so my name is Namita Shah. I'm on the executive committee of Total, and amongst the many things that I do, I'm also responsible for India uh, and building our, our relationship with India. So Total doesn't have a very, very long history in India. We've had a long history, but in a small, in a very small field, uh, basically in, in southern India and in LPG and lubricants. And for various reasons, we haven't been able to, uh, you know, uh, to build a, a big relationship in India either, because traditionally we were in the exploration and production fields, and and that was not something where we saw India as having uh, resources to exploit. And also because there's been, you know, this idea in the company for a very long time that it's it, it's very difficult to do business in India. Um, in the last two years, uh, there's been a big change. Um, so a couple of years ago, we decided to make a, a, a big move in India. Uh, India is, uh, and it sort of uh, responds to this idea that everybody's talking about, about India uh, developing, about ease of business in India getting better, about India being a major market, of course, for energy. Uh, but um, but as manufacturing grows, grows in India, as 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 individual citizens of India continue to go up uh, in the ladder, energy demands are definitely going to increase. And uh, the second, I think, big trend, uh, which is very important for us, is um, everything that's going around, going on around us in terms of climate. Uh, and also India's very stated, you know, objective that they want to play their role in uh, in reducing the the impact of, of um, you know, and, and helping in, in, in controlling climate change. So a couple of years ago, we came into India in really the LNG um, and gas and renewables businesses. So that's the area in which we really want to accompany the growth that we are going to be seeing in India. Um, if, manage, if manufacturing takes off, and I'm confident that it can, um, there's going to be, of course, a huge need for, for, for the industry to think about where they're going to get uh, the reliable energy from, because having reliable energy is a key to be able to um, have an economically viable industrial model. Um, and coupling that with renewable energy, um, you know, India is extremely reliant on coal today for, for many reasons, uh, one of them, of course, being cost and the other being it, it, it's available uh, made in India, um, but the energy growth is going to be such that they're going to have to look for other sources of energy. And um, while there's a massive explosion of, rena of renewable energy in the country, uh, they're also, I think, going to have to look towards gas as a source to stabilize the energy that comes from renewable energy. Um, and, um, and they also have a couple of ideas about being a sort of a hub for the import of, of LNG, especially in the eastern part of the country, uh, where they are developing uh, LNG import facilities, which can then maybe access the eastern market in places like Bangladesh and, and, and Myanmar. So there is definitely a, a big change. And uh, if I can sort of close the circle, um, we were talking about capital markets and uh, India actually, uh, and we actually, <laughs> Uh, participated in in uh, an investment in a publicly listed company. I can tell you that it took us almost eight months to figure out and understand the process and get the answers to all our questions and get comfortable with with how it was going to happen uh, with a partner who you know who understood that we want needed to understand everything, but at the same time kept saying, you know, just just trust us, it, it'll work out. 
and, and both of those things are true. Um, so, uh, so you know, we're looking forward to continuing um, to accompany the, the the growth that India is, is right. definitely going to see. Right. So, Sumit, I'm going to come to you. Uh, uh, Namita, when can we see total petrol pumps in the country? Well, in the partnership that we have with Adani, we have, we have decided that we're going to look at the, the, the launch in the retail sector. Uh, when, you know, we wanted to do it two years ago, but it was very, again, the regulations were very complicated to get a retail license. Um, they've ch completely changed the processes, so hopefully that will make it easier. Um, and we're looking, we're looking at how we can get our brand name out there, for sure. Okay, okay, thanks for that. Sumit, last word. Yeah, yeah go in. I think we've got five minutes for a hard stop. I want to give it back to you, so I'm going to take a minute if I can. Uh, yeah. Just a couple of things. India can be a hub for as a market and a, as a manufacturing base, for sure. It goes together in a sense. If you invest in the Indian market, you've got to build for India and build from out, for outside India. I think if you look forward for the next 10 years, as India doubles its economy from a $3 trillion economy to a $6 trillion economy, it's a huge amount of, of money that's going to be consumed and is going to be built in this country. Uh, so that's promising. Uh, if you look at French investments in India, I got my team at Insight to do some analysis. Out of the SBF 120 companies, uh, only about 80 are in India. And, and they're, very, they're doing well. They're about 11 billion euros in sale. They're growing at about 9% a year. Uh, they're, uh, they're profitable. Uh, but if you go, go deeper, you realize that 10 companies account for 75% of that. And therefore, the balance 70 top 80 French companies actually have an average business size in India of only $40 million. So as you can see, there's a lot of catching up to do that French companies have, and there's a huge opportunity going forward. And I think with that, I'll stop so I can leave it back to you to at least ask one or two more questions. Right. Thanks for that, uh, Sumit. So let me throw it. it it's, a, it's a broader question. I think one is, uh, I mean, we know the context. We're talking about manufacturing, uh, Indian, uh, Indian market as a hub, uh, as a destination in itself. So what's what's the competitive pressure here, and uh, and and what does India have to think about, and uh, you know whether it comes to global capital flows, uh, your own uh, priorities in this COVID world, uh, is it are we uh, in the globalization, deglobalization tension? Where are we today? And, and I'm sure all of that matters. So uh, let me uh, throw for, throw that first to uh, uh, Alain, and uh, then anyone's welcome to pitch in. No, I think the market uh, macroeconomically for the last years has developed pretty well. Obviously, this year, the impact of COVID will have uh, probably uh, generate a negative uh, GDP, which is estimated between uh, minus five, minus, uh, minus four, minus five, with a rebound next year. Then I think the trend is good. After that, the, the, the capital flow, I think, has improved significantly. I would say mostly on the equity side. Huh? We see more and more private equity firms interested by investing in India, where I think there is still a, a, an issue, in a way, or a big challenge in terms of financing the Indian economy. Let's uh, put away the, the global hub, is the fact that uh, Indian individuals are big savers, but part of the savings goes to banks or go and, you know, buy gold. Uh, and then the capacity in the country to issue bonds. And clearly, when we have discussion with Indian officials, the biggest challenge of the next 10 years is infrastructure financing, as Mark uh, mentioned. Uh, it's a country who needs roads, who needs bridges, who needs new airports, etc. And today, it's almost impossible to finance it privately because there is no long-term investors uh, to buy the bonds. Uh, and you, you, you probably have seen recently uh, some dramas, I would say, in financial markets in India, where people were financing long-term needs, like the same company, uh, by issuing very short-term bonds. Uh, and then uh, there was a couple of them which needed a, a bail-in with the support of the government. Then, I think making sure that the market mechanism uh, and the regulation is done in such a way that long-term savings are privileged and supported by the government so that you create a very agile financial market is what the country needs as a priority. Right. Okay. Uh, Mark, a quick word from you. I mean, uh, what is India competing with? I mean, uh, you yourself are sitting in Dubai, you've got a large portfolio and so does your company as a whole. Well, I think uh, India is competing with a lot of uh, other markets, you know, where, you know, ease of doing business is, is 
at a better position than what we see in India. You know, when you want to set up a, a plant, a tire plant, on average will cost you between 500 million to 700 million euros. So it's a, it's a multi, it's like 20, 30 years investment. So when you set up this type of investment, which is what we did uh, 10 years ago, you need to have clear visibility on what's going to be uh, the strategy of the government in terms of regulation. Uh, right. What we've seen today is clearly the government pushing the make in India, which is great. We support it. But at the same time, the government cannot be you know, in the shoes of the company to decide what should be produced in India. We want to come with high tech technology. We don't want to do what exists already in India. We want to help the development of India. We are not just do business in India. We want to be part of the development of India. And I think that's the type of discussion we're having currently with the government. We are investing uh, in India to export to the world, latest technology that we do on mobility. So that's our willingness to change, you know, this market. Right. Uh, Namita, are we, uh, are companies and French companies for that matter globalizing like before? Are French companies globalizing like before? I think that, I think, you know, successful companies, whether they are French or not, uh, can't afford to not globalize. I mean, I know that we are seeing this trend of, you know, are we going to move away from globalization? But but I, I don't think that that's an option. And I don't think that that's an option that we should be defending at all. I think we need to continue pushing this idea that globalization, uh, it, you know, we, we need to first of all deal with the idea that only large companies have benefit from globalization. We need to sort of find a way to communicate on how everybody benefits from it. And we need to continue pushing to say that globalization is, is, is the right way forward because Without it, um, companies won't grow. But I think that countries like India won't, won't grow if right. globalization doesn't come to them. Right. OK, so you're thematically arguing for globalization. Uh, Jean-Marc, is that something uh, you agree with? I mean, are, are, is, are companies still in an expansionary mode, particularly now? I mean, given the challenges that they must be facing in uh, domestic markets as well, including in France? I, uh, I believe it's the only way to grow. And uh, globalizing uh, is certainly uh, the best vehicle uh, right. to have uh, this growth. Uh, and also uh, from uh, people or employment point of view, I strongly believe that uh, globalization is a plus. Okay, uh, so there is a clear endorsement for globalization in a, in a general sense. Uh, Sumit and uh, Jerome, so where does this... Uh, leave uh, India in terms of what it has to do uh, to get even more investment than what it is, apart from what you've already mentioned. Sharon, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, sorry, no, I think that uh, I mean, as far as we can see, uh, uh, India can continue on this, on this way, uh, bringing um, innovation. Again, I, I come back on this point because uh, it's a country where we've been able to invent uh, many things that were useful outside of, um, of uh, the, do the domestic market. Uh, so, um, fr from our perspective, uh, we just need to uh, to take the same uh, level of risk uh, that the one who has been taken uh, uh, 13 years ago. Uh, be confident about the capacity of India to uh, to perform even in time of uncertainty. And uh, I'm, I'm sure that uh, uh, results will come. I mean, from a single company perspective, but more broadly, uh, when when we look at that market. Right, okay, I think we've, uh, Sumit, you've gone dark, uh, and maybe, maybe you have a power cut or something in uh, Delhi, so that's, uh, as always, uh, the energy opportunity in this country. So uh, let me come back, let me, uh, as I wind up, is uh, Mark around, I just want to ask Mark if you're still there, uh, when are you uh, bringing uh, the Michelin uh, Guide to India, which in itself is a indicator of many other good things to come. You're on mute. Thank you very much, Govin. Thank you. You're first of all, you know, I, I think we need to build a brand. There is not so many people, and you're one of the few that realize that the Michelin tires and the Red Guides are together the same company. Uh, so we're building the brand. We're investing in uh, TV campaigns. Uh, I would say that the food scene in India is one of the most amazing and one that is missing, you know, uh, in our. Uh, in our uh, guide. So after, you know, you have France, you have, of course, Thailand, you have Japan. We would love to come to India. Um, if you have any contact at the Board of Tourism so we can talk and maybe launch it in the coming years, we would be great. Uh, that would be fantastic. And uh, no, no, that would be that would be great. And it would make a lot of sense. 
Right. And that's always, food is always a good note to end on and the food opportunity. And uh, though we have been talking about manufacturing and uh, India as a global hub. So on that note, I have to leave. Thank you very much for uh, having me uh, uh, to all of you at uh, the IFKI. And let me hand it back to Sumit, uh, who's uh, reappeared now. And uh, 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 on that note, uh, uh, very good night to all of you. Thank, thank, you, you, thank you very much. Goodbye. Th thanks, Gohan. Sorry about that. As you, the energy challenge in India. Uh, Priyank, back to you. Thank you, Sumit. Uh, thank you, everyone, for this excellent discussion. It truly is our pleasure to have you all join us today, creating this digital bridge, so to say, uh, between India and France. As we come to the end of today's program, I would like to invite Mr. Emeric De uh CEO of Credit Agricole India, to share the official closing remarks. Yeah, thank you very much. So from uh, what we just heard, uh, I think we can all uh, value uh, the future of the Indian manufacturing sector is of paramount importance for both French and Indian economies. Uh, the Indian uh, manufacturing sector has indeed uh, gone through uh, major transformation held by significant reforms announced by the government in recent times. I will only mention uh, the decision to slash the corporate tax rates of new manufacturing companies down to 17%, uh, which is the lowest in South Asia. Initiatives uh, like uh, the Make in India that we discussed, as well as uh, incentives in specific sectors, uh, are contributing to foster foreign direct invest investments in the manufacturing sector. Uh, and we can see that the level of uh, FDI, as uh, mentioned by, by Sumit, uh, this level is increasing over the years and is a good indicator of the continuous effort to improve uh, the doing business environment. This, together with the recent good and service tax reform, uh, with the low labor cost, uh, is encourage, encouraging foreign companies to, to relocate their production bases to India. Uh, it's a, as we discussed, it's a, it's a very strong it has a very strong macroeconomic fundamentals, uh, a rise of a large middle class, uh, the growth and demand potential, a very skilled labor, and uh, a political leadership, uh, which makes of this uh, country uh, a, a, a really a unique, uh, a unique potential for to become in the future a prominent factor, a manufacturing hub. Now, on behalf of all uh, IFKI members, I would like to thank the IFKI, the IFKI team who organized uh, this wonderful AGM in such a difficult context. Many thanks, uh, Payal, Bruno, and all the team. I think all the, the members uh, are really uh, have enjoyed very much uh, this event. I will wind up by uh, thanking also all the speakers and panelists who shared their views and experiences. It was really great to hear about your company's respective journey in this country. Uh, let's hope that uh, next year AGM will not be virtual. It would be nice to see each other. Uh, so once again, thank you all and uh, well, uh, have a, a very nice evening.